Hey guys, this is Ruckus Gaming coming at you with the latest installment of the Slay the Spire Relic tier list. Today we're taking a look at the boss relics. So, without further ado, let's just jump straight into it. First up, we have Astrolabe, which will transform three cards and upgrade them. I'm going to take Astrolabe and throw it right up at a tier. I think this is something that I know myself, I definitely slept on this for a long time. And I think that there are quite a few relics that are probably better than most people will give them credit for, but because it's not the, oh my god, you know, this is Sneko or Runic Pyramid or the exact perfect fourth energy relic for whatever my deck is, getting a fourth energy relic is something everyone's excited for. Astrolabe is not a sexy, exciting relic, but I think it is something that will immediately improve your deck. Probably by more than you think. Getting rid of three strikes or defense, getting cards that are guaranteed to be better than them, and then upgrading those cards can make a huge difference, and it gives you an immediate power spike I think this is especially really good at the end of Act 1, before your deck has really started to come together with a central theme, probably. At the end of Act 2, you may be more settled into what your deck wants to do. Maybe the transforms are not as beneficial. But in Act 1, this is a very strong take if the other options are not the oh my god wow options. Next up we have the Ironclad exclusive. This is Black Blood, and I'm going to put that right into D tier. I think that this has a huge opportunity cost to it. In general, I think the boss relic pull is quite strong, so getting six more HP per fight when you could be getting fourth energy, when you could be getting you know, retain in your hand when you could be getting the Sneko confusion buff, which lowers the cost of your high cost cards and really speed things up. This one really feels bad. It's a very ho hum relic and it's only six HP more. It's just not very much. If you've built a strong deck that can either not take a lot of damage and your ending fights near max HP, if you are already running a deck that has quite a bit of sustain to it, this is not going to do very much on top of that. But if you are perhaps, you know, doing a very heavy self-damaging deck and you don't have a healing option yet, this could be takeable. But even in a case like that, you still might want to take a fourth energy relic over something like this. Six HP, more than your starter relic, not really the best relic in my opinion. And I love Ironclad. Next up is Black Star, which will double the relics that drop from Elite Combats. I'm gonna put that right into B tier. I think this is something I may have overvalued at first, actually, as a newer player. I knew that relics were important and rares, or not rares, but elites were how to get them. And so getting Black Star, I would be trying to hit every single possible elite I could. And maybe if your skill ceiling is higher than mine was at the time, it could be a good idea. I think it over encouraged me to take elites when I wasn't really ready for them. But the real actual downside to this is there is no immediate power bump. If you get this at the end of Act 1, you're really looking to get something that's going to boost the ability of your deck to get stronger, to get through those combats. Act 2 can be pretty spooky. Your first elite will give you two relics, which is essentially the same as what you would have gotten if you had just taken a normal boss relic and then gotten one relic from the first elite. So you need to at least take two relic or two elites for this to really give you a positive effect. But then of course, every elite after the 
first will have this kind of compounding effect. So it could really help you snowball, but it kind of depends on you having a really strong deck early on. And interestingly enough, this does not have effects on elites that you may see in events such as Dead Adventurer if you do a boss swap and get that event in Act 1, or the Colosseum Act. This will not actually grant you a second relic when you fight elites through events, so that is one thing to keep in mind. Next up we have Busted Crown, which grants you a fourth or fifth or just whatever one more extra energy at the cost of two less cards in each future card reward. I'm going to put that in C tier. I know a lot of people don't like this relic because they don't like having their choices limited. It is kind of anti-fun, but I also don't hate it as much as a lot of other people do. I think it is an especially good take after Act 2 when your deck is already pretty well shaped up. You might be able to add a couple more cards you might be looking for, but you know, you can hit up shops. There's possible ways maybe you transform something from an event. It's not the absolute end of the world, especially if the other two relics that offer after the Act 2 boss are not really, wow, amazing relics. You can take this and not feel too bad about it, though I do definitely think that just the anti-fun reduction of choice, even if mechanically is not the biggest penalty necessarily, really discourages people from taking this. They like seeing the cards, they want to see them, but there are worse relics and there are definitely better relics. Next up we have the Calling Bell, which will put a permanent curse into your deck which you cannot remove, you cannot transform, you cannot get rid of in any way, but then it will also give you three relics. It will give you one common, one uncommon, and one rare. And I'm going to throw that right at the tippy top of A tier for now. I absolutely love this relic. Personal opinion, I think that a lot of decks can handle one more curse, even though I generally discourage go to getting more curses. I think the three relics that you get out of this can be absolutely super powerful especially in the ways that they might combine together with some good synergies. The power boost that this can give you is very significant, and the drawback is minimal in my opinion. If you have an ironclad exhaust deck, if you've got a defect deck that has lots of draw and energy, you can just keep drawing and the card won't matter too much. You know, Silent can discard. I think Watcher is maybe the only one that doesn't have a great way to get rid of curses, aside from just draw lots of cards with Rush Down, Stance Switching, and then even if you get a colorless card like Purity, you can get rid of the curse. So, not the biggest penalty for potentially a very massive power bump. I think this is A tier, maybe S tier, but I'll leave it in A tier for now. Next up is Coffee Dripper, which will grant you one more additional energy per turn at the cost of no more resting at campfires. I was unsure exactly where to place this. I kind of switched my mind back and forth a couple of times. At the end of the day, I'm going to put it at the tippy top of A tier. I think generally you don't want to be resting at fires, so the drawback of this is quite small. It is also something that can be worked around. It is no healing from fires, but that does not mean you cannot heal from potions. You can also get healing from the cards in your deck. You could get healing from other relics. You can get healing from events. There are a lot of options to get around it. but. I will say that it does feel really, really bad if you are having a tough run 
and you just get out of an elite combat, you hit the next fire, and you're like, man, I really wish I could heal right now, just to make sure that I had a little bit of cushion moving forward. And if your deck doesn't have sustain at all, then this is really going to be a tough play. There's something to be said about just having that blanket of security in the back of your mind, knowing, you know, I do want to upgrade most of the time, but every once in a while, you really do want to have a heal at a campfire. So also feels bad if, you know, you've already got something like Regal Pillow does work great with Eternal Feather, so look at your Relic Bar, see if you've got healing there that may reduce that, and it could turn this from a high A into a low S tier Relic, depending on the amount of sustain that you already have. Next up is Cursed Key, which will give you one additional energy per turn at the cost of opening a chest granting you a curse. I'm going to put this into the B tier. The good thing about the drawback that this has is that it says you have to open the chest. So if you get to one of those treasure rooms or you see an event that gives you treasure and it's a small chest, like that small wooden chest, it is most likely going to give you a common relic I think the common relic is actually pretty good, but maybe you're not interested in risking a curse for a common relic, so you can just skip that chest completely, not open it, not take the relic, not take the curse. If you already have the blue key, maybe you got an early blue key, you got, you know, the boot in your Act 1 treasure node, and you said, screw the boot, I'll just take the early key. This is great because you don't have to open a future chest just to get the key and then also receive a curse. That being said, you do want to be adding relics to your deck in general most of the time. This does put more weight on the quality of your deck and the cards because the number of relics you might receive over the run potentially could be significantly lowered if you skip lots of chests or if you take lots of curses. So not quite as crippling as the Busted Crown, even though I wouldn't necessarily call Busted Crown crippling, but it does have a downside that you do need to consider. And some decks I think can absorb this quite easily. Other decks not so much. Very, very situational. Let's say that. Next up is Ectoplasm. This is only an Act 1 relic. You cannot get this in Act 2. And what this will do is give you an additional energy at the cost of no longer gaining any gold for the rest of the run. No matter what, this is garbage. F tier. The fact that you can only get it after Act 1 means that you have not had very much time to build up a sufficient bank of gold already. If you've already gone to a shop, if you have swapped out gold for a rare relic or for a rare card or whatever one of the Niao bonus was, you're not going to have a lot of gold when you get this. There's a good chance you're going to see looters in Act 2 who will steal your gold. It has anti-synergy with quite a few relics. It will prevent you from interacting with several events that have minimum gold requirements for buying things, for trading things, for offering gold. It is just so bad. I cannot imagine wanting this ever. I just hate this relic. And I, you know, I've seen other people post videos of them taking ectoplasm and beating an A20 run and more power to you. But I would just never, ever want to take this. 
even if the other relics were really bad. I think this is probably the worst one. It will not let you get any gold, no matter what. It makes shops worse. I think shops are one of the most important and valuable floors in the game, just because of the amount of different things that they can offer you, and it turns that into a dead floor. I just hate this relic. Never take it. Next up is Empty Cage, which is a simple remove two cards relic. I'm gonna put this in B tier. I think that it is, again, something that is not sexy in the same way that Astrolabe is not sexy, just removing two cards compared to some of the other powerful, awesome relics in the boss pool. You just go, what the hell? But over time, I have grown to really appreciate this, especially if you are trying to get an infinite. Perhaps if you have some nasty curses, like a normality or two from an event, this is amazing to see. But in general, I think because of what a lot of people want to see, this could be quite disappointing in some ways. Maybe it helps you make a decision, saying, oh, I've got, you know, a great relic, an okay relic, and a bad relic. Well, there's only two choices here, and it's definitely not going to be empty cage, so I guess I'll take whatever that fourth energy relic is, or, you know, something like that. It might simplify a choice. Not something that necessarily wins a run for you, but does provide great value. I mean, even if you're just removing two strikes or two defense, that's going to make your deck immediately bigger or better, not bigger. Makes your deck smaller. But again, just doesn't feel very fun, even though it offers great benefits. So I throw that in the B tier. Next up is Frozen Core. This is our first defect exclusive boss relic. This will replace your starting relic, so you will lose that lightning orb at the end of each combat. But at the end of each turn, if you have any empty orb slots, you will channel one frost orb. I'm gonna put this in C tier. I will freely admit that I am not the best defect player. I think that if you get this after act one, it can be okay. After Act 2, I think you've probably settled into a really strong deck strategy. Maybe this fits into that, maybe it doesn't. If you get an Act 1, the losing of the orb is not too bad. You want that orb to do early damage. Dual casting your lightning orbs is a great way to end Act 1 hallway fights early boss swapping into this with that in mind is not a great thing for act one because you do want that damage you're going to be very slow in act one which is not what you want to be so if you're doing a defect run and you've got a boss swap just keep this one kind of in the back of your mind i think boss swaps tend to be kind of high roll low roll situations a lot of the time but it can also provide decent value, you know, a lot of decks do want to have more frost in them. I think, you know, you're always happy to see something like cool headed. So over the course of a combat, it can generate a lot of block for you, especially if you've got some focus, if you can get like a capacitor or you get the inserter relic from another boss. This will very much be a great block engine for you. But it really just depends on kind of when you get it, how you get it, and what the rest of your deck looks like. Extremely situational, but not bad. So I'm going to put that in C tier. Next up is Fusion Hammer, which grants you a, an additional energy. And it means that you cannot up 
upgrade your cards at campfires for the rest of the run. I'm going to put this right below Coffee Dripper, top of A tier. This was another one where I waffled back and forth a little bit. The reason why relics like Coffee Dripper or Fusion Hammer are much higher than something like Ectoplasm is the fact that Ectoplasm says no gold ever. Fusion Hammer says no upgrading at fires. You can still upgrade in other ways. If you get Apotheosis, you know, if you're playing Watcher and you have Lesson Learned, if you get to events, you know, Mark of the Bloom in the end of Act 3 would be amazing with Fusion Hammer. There are not quite as many ways around it as there are for Coffee Dripper. And I think that is where the important distinction is for me, making the very slight ranking difference here between the two. There are a lot of different ways for you to heal, even with Coffee Dripper. There aren't quite as many ways to heal around Fusion Hammer or upgrade around Fusion Hammer. It's been a long day, I can't talk. That being said, there are also some kinds of decks that don't really need lots of upgrades. If you get this at the end of Act 2, you've probably gotten most of your key upgrades. Maybe you've got relics like Toxic Egg or something like that, which are giving you upgrades. So you can still get them. Probably not as many ways as Coffee Dripper to be worked around, but you can definitely work around it. And some decks just don't really need it. If you're doing a Claw deck, you probably don't need a ton of upgrades. You can just play Claw. That's how you upgrade Claw, is you play Claw. So, most of the decks do want upgrades, but there's ways to get around it. Just not quite as many as there are ways to get around Coffee Dripper, so slightly under Coffee Dripper. Next up is Holy Water. This is the Watcher specific boss swap or a boss relic that swaps for your starter relic. I'm gonna put this at the bottom of A tier. I'm gonna do all of the character exclusive at the bottom of their tier just on the basis of being character exclusives. I think you could definitely say that some of these character exclusive could be higher than the relics that are available to all characters, but I just like putting the exclusives, the exclusives at the end. My goodness, I really gotta slow down. Anyway, what this does, it replaces your starting relic for the Watcher, and instead of one miracle at the beginning of combat, you get three miracles. This is just a straight upgrade. I think there are some other upgrades like the Black Blood that don't even feel like an upgrade sometimes. And an extra two energy is not a lot necessarily, but it can be just enough to really kind of flip over and get going whatever kind of engine you're trying to get going. Sometimes you do find yourself just one energy short there's one card you really, really want to play, and this can help you get there. And then once Watcher starts going, it's already over, basically. So, very, very high quality relic. It would be great if you could get this on everybody, but unfortunately just for the Watcher. Next up, we have another defect exclusive. This is Inserter. Every two turns, you will gain one orb slot. I'm gonna put this again right at the top, or not top, but bottom of A tier. And I think that this is a fantastic relic. I think you could make a very strong argument for S tier, but I think that all of my S tier relics, except one, are relics that can be obtained by all characters. When you're playing Defect, the number one way to improve your win rate, I think, and to make powerful decks is to really lean into orbs. More orbs, more focus is generally the 
pattern or the, the formula for winning, no matter what those orbs are, more orbs and more powerful orbs just helps you win. And this is great for doing that. The slight downside is that it can make your orbs harder to evoke. So you may have to be a little bit more cognizant of how you are both evoking and creating orbs. I like to try and kind of go through a cycle. I'll do one frost orb and one lightning orb and one dark orb. Because if you've got a whole bunch of lightning orbs stacked up and you really, really need to block, but your frost orb is all the way back at like your sixth or seventh, it can be a challenge to get to that frost orb when you need it. So that is one thing to keep in mind. It works really great with darkness because it can let that darkness orb cook longer. It's great for plasma because it keeps the plasma around longer before you lose it. But not a big drawback, just something to keep in mind and offers a great deal of power. Arguably S tier, but I'm going to keep it here for now. Next up, we're going to have an ironclad exclusive, Mark of Pain. This will grant you one extra energy, and it will shuffle two wounds into your draw pile. I'm going to put that in B tier. I think that ironclad is a lot of ways to work around this with exhaust. You know, whether it's sever soul or second wind or true grit or burning pact. There are definitely ways around this, but it can create issues, especially if you have something like runic pyramid. You don't want your hand getting clogged up with a lot of this. And it does kind of depend on your draw order. It's not going to ever appear in your opening hand, but drawing your wounds before you get into something like, you know, Fire Breathing or Evolved or any of your exhaust synergy cards, it's going to slow down your ability to get your deck started, get that engine running. And at the end of Act 3, I think one of the biggest problems I've had in my runs is just bad draw and not having ways to deal with bad draw. If you've got a good amount of draw in your deck and you feel confident that you can get these wounds out or you can ha perhaps lean into them and utilize them you know maybe you've got reckless charge or wild strike and you're just doing a crazy fire breathing evolve deck this is great for that but it does kind of rely on you getting those powers into play in a reasonable amount of time so that the wounds aren't hurting more than they're helping very draw reliant next up i believe is the final defect exclusive nuclear battery it creates one plasma orb at the start of every combat for you i'm going to throw this at the bottom of a tier i think this is like a better lantern it's very very comparable to the watcher boss swap relic the downside is, is it is not a permanent source of energy you can evoke this plasma and lose it if you do not have any other sources of plasma if you do have other sources of plasma even better many of those are high cost cards like meteor strike uh, fusion itself is too cost if it's unupgraded so it can help you get those more expensive cards into play to keep the plasma around. But even things like recursion or dual cast or multicast can really make the most out of this. And I think even if it's not a permanent energy, most of the time, by the time you have lost it, it has done its job. So it's kind of like cards that exhaust on Ironclad or anybody really. You don't need it to stick around. You just need it to get going. 
and it does that very, very well. So, nuclear battery, very strong relic. I think in general, the defect probably has the best average overall of the exclusive pool, if just for inserter and nuclear battery alone. Next up, we have Pandora's box. This will transform every strike and defend in your deck into something new, but it will not upgrade it in the way that Astrolabe does. Regardless, this is going up into S tier, and I think that is not a surprise. A lot of people really love this relic. I think new players might be scared away from it because of the randomness. They're afraid that they might transform into cards that are bad or useless. But the way I look at this is that Strikes and Defends are the worst cards in the game. No matter what they transform into, it will be better than Strikes and Defends. Now, that being said, obviously, if you've built a poison deck on the silent and this suddenly starts to generate accuracies out the wazoo for you you might be like what the hell this is useless to me or you know you're doing shivs and this is you know giving you catalyst you're like what the hell this is useless but at the end of the day you can still try and get some value out of it and it's not any worse than a striker or defend, to be completely honest. There are a lot of high roll Pandora's boxes out there just waiting for you to take them. Please take them. They are amazing. And on top of that, there's a super fun glitch if you just want to get a tiny, tiny deck. Maybe you want to get that minimalist achievement and you've been hitting your head against the wall. Abandon run. On confirm screen, double hit escape, you will lose all the strikes and defense, and you will not get any of the new transformed cards. So, if you don't really care about glitching, if you just want to get something done, if you're doing a daily run for fun, you don't care about, you know, did I play it the right way, you know, did I cheat? Sometimes glitching can be fun. So, if you haven't taken Pandora's box, a lot in the past start doing it just for fun trust me you will have fun with pandora's box next up is philosopher's stone this is one permanent energy more per turn at the cost of buffing your enemies with one strength at the beginning of each combat i'm gonna put this in d tier there are ways to deal with enemies getting buffed for example Something like Disarm, Weaken, etc. But most of the toughest enemies and hardest combats in this game, whether they are the Act 2 or Act 3 Elites, whether they are the bosses, Shield and Spear, the Heart, all of these really, really, really hard fights, most of them have multi-attack turns. And this is just going to make those even harder, especially the heart. And it's not really that first 2x15 that's going to kill you. It's the 4x15, four, four turns later, that's going to kill you. And that's even if you get past the birds. Because we all know that Philosopher's Stone is essentially a bird summoning stone if you take this at the end of Act 1. It is something you can take in very very limited circumstances maybe the other relics that you're being offered are hot garbage cough cough ectoplasm cough cough otherwise this is another one of those relics that i just generally steer clear of i think the drawback that it has is really hard to work around not impossible but hard and there are just generally better options we're not quite finished with this tier list yet but you can see that it is pretty top heavy you don't want to waste a good relic on philosopher's stone next up is the 
boss swap relic for the watcher. This, not watcher, I'm sorry. The silent. Really can't speak today. This will replace your starting relic. This is Ring of the Serpent. And instead of two extra cards on turn one, this will give you one extra card on all turns. I believe I put this in C tier. Admittedly, I'm not very good at the silent. She is probably my weakest character, so I could be very, very wrong here. But in general, I am not a fan of making your first turns worse. This makes your first turn worse by giving you one less card. And it doesn't make your second turn better. When you have the starting relic for the silent, your first two turns you will draw 12 cards. If you swap out of this, your first two turns you will draw 12 cards. Your first turn will be worse. And overall, you will be no better after the second turn. It will only be the third turn that this begins to really give you a benefit. In that vein, it acts very much the same as something like, oh, what is it? It's not tools of the trade. I'm blanking on, I thought there was some kind of power card that gave the silent one extra draw per turn. Maybe I'm just thinking of tools of the trade giving you the ability to discard. Regardless, I could be totally wrong, but I just think that you don't want to make your first turn worse. Ultimately, your second turn won't be any better. And your third turn and after will be improved. Silent can stall and get to that third turn pretty easily, I think. But in general, I just don't like making my first turn worse. Next up, we have Runic Cube, the Ironclad exclusive. Every time you take damage, you draw one card. I think that is a solid C tier relic. The Ironclad has a lot of cards that deal self damage and can make great use of this. I think it is much better than Centennial Puzzle because it does not only apply to the first instance of damage. I'm trying to remember, and I cannot completely 100% for sure remember, but my feeling is that when you take damage from an enemy, it will draw a card and then you can keep that card in your hand and draw five on the next turn. I cannot be completely sure about that. I don't take this a lot because I feel in general that the pool is just so strong. I am not low rolling a ton of iron clad boss relic pools. I think you're almost always going to get some kind of fourth energy or you're trying to get Calling Bell or Pandora's. There aren't a lot of times you look at your relic pool after a boss fight and see complete garbage. And in that case, you would take this and feel okay about it. But most of the time you do want other things. And if you don't see them and this is the only thing you've got, it's kind of a bummer. In my mind, I'm kind of talking myself up into rating it a little higher just because of the draw and how much you can get out of it with Ironclad. But I think for now, I'll keep it where it is, C tier. Next up is Runic Dome. You get one additional energy per turn at the cost of no longer seeing enemy intents. I'm gonna put this in B tier. I think this is something that has a very scary downside. But if you've got the experience, if you've got the knowledge, it's not that bad. And even if you're new, I heavily advise taking this at least a couple of times and then 
pulling up the wiki and, you know, alt-tabbing in and out of the game. You can just look up their attack patterns. You can download mods like Bestiary or Intent Graph, which are essentially doing the same as looking at the wiki. They are not, like, reading code and quote-unquote cheating by telling you, oh, this is 100% what he will do next. It's just saying, oh, there's a 60% chance they'll do this, there's a 30% chance they'll do that, they can't do it two times in a row. Like, there's still some chance and math involved, and you're never guaranteed to be completely 100% informed of what's happening next. But it is a great learning opportunity. It's a very slow, heavy thinking kind of run, which may or may not fit your personal play style and just sense of enjoyment. I think a lot of people will readily admit that this is a quite good relic. It gives you potentially free energy, but it does have a kind of high skill floor to it, if that makes sense. Also, if you get the Tangled Mass Combat, it can be real rough. You basically have to accept possibly taking that curse, or even worse, like dying to a really, really big hit. If you get Tangled Mass, you're gonna have to just YOLO it and kill that thing as fast as possible with as few hits as possible. Also, while trying to block as much as possible. That's a really tough fight. Otherwise, though, all the other enemies have very well-defined attack patterns, and if you just look up the information, and you just do a little bit of risk assessment. Okay, there's a 60% chance he'll buff, there's a 40% chance they'll attack. I'm probably okay. I'll try to attack this turn. You might get punished, you might not, but at least you made an informed choice. Next up we have Runic Pyramid, which has the effect of no longer discarding any cards from your hand at the end of your turn. I'm gonna throw this top of A tier, get over there. Absolutely love Runic Pyramid because it solves one of the biggest problems that you're ever going to have in any run. Playing the right card at the right time. Everyone has had the situation of, oh, I've got a handful of block cards and the enemy is not attacking. I've got a handful of attack cards and the enemy is hitting me for 50 plus damage. And you're just like, wow, there's nothing I can do here. Runic Pyramid solves that problem. If you have really powerful but situational cards, like maybe an Impervious on an Ironclad, or maybe you want to hold on to your Vigilance on Watcher or your Empty Fist so you can always have it in your back pocket and you never have to worry about being trapped in Wrath again. Maybe you want to hold on to Biased Cog until the right moment or until you have the correct hand of cards to get your Core Surge off before or your orange pellets with the attack and a skill and a power. Like, there are so many powerful, useful ways to use this. The main drawback is if you have status cards filling up your hand, something like wounds from Book of Stabbing or other status cards. And this is also a hard pass if you already have Sneko. Do not take this with Sneko. I have made that mistake once. Don't do it. You're gonna transform all those strikes into three cost cards. They will be curses in your hand. You will never play those strikes. And then your hand will slowly fill. You will not be drawing more cards and you will just die. Do not take this with Sneko Eye as great as each of them are on their own, they are absolute dog shit together. Next up is Sacred Bark, which doubles the effectiveness of potions. 
as much as I love potions, I'm still going to have to put this very close to the bottom of D tier. Again, the overall boss relic pool is quite strong. There are almost no situations where you are really desperate to play potions twice. There can be some very fun, wacky, silly effects when you use Sacred Bark. Perhaps if you're doing something like a silent alchemize potion belt, white beast statue run. Yeah, okay, go for Sacred Bark. That might be real fucking fun. Otherwise, there's probably better choices. It's not going to be something you're picking over other good, more widely useful relics. That's about it. Next up is Slaver's Collar. This gives you one permanent energy per turn, but only during elite and boss fights. I'm going to put this close to the bottom of B tier. I think this provides good value when you need it the most in those really tough fights. However, it does not provide an immediate strength boost to your deck, which is the number one reason that I don't think I can rate it any higher than this. It will not make your deck immediately better when you add it to your relic bar, but it is a fourth energy relic and it will do what it needs to do when it needs to do it the most. So I think there are plenty times when I've taken this, when I have received a less than stellar roll on my boss relics, and I'm not mad about it at all. I sometimes wish it was a little better and you know, sometimes those Act 2 combats might feel like elites, and you wish you had a fourth energy for them, but generally speaking, it's no right relic. Nothing that I'm wildly crazy about, but I certainly don't hate it. Next up is Sneko Eye. This relic gives you extra draw per turn. I believe it's two cards per turn. And it also randomizes the costs of cards as you draw them. I'm going to put this at the top SS tier, tippy top. I think we've all had situations where a snack eye has kind of screwed us and given us a handful of three cost cards. But if you have mods that can track your relics, such as the relic stat mod, something like that. I have to look up the name. Slay the Spire relic stats, slay the stats. I don't know. There are many different mods that will give you additional statistics about how your relics are fun functioning. And the number one thing this does is on average, it will reduce the cost of cards and it will allow you to play more cards per turn. Obviously there are situations where that doesn't happen and you get lots of high cost cards, but over the course of a run, generally speaking, mathematically it has been shown that this will reduce the cost of cards and increase the amount of cards you can play. All good things. You can work with something like orange pellets to remove that, and it could work to a great advantage. The cards that have already been drawn will still have their changed cost, but that can work to your benefit. I just saw someone talking about a run where they had Meteor Strike as well as orange pellets. And so they would get their Meteor Strikes down to be like, one or two cost. They would remove the Sneko Confusion with orange pellets, and then they just had two cost meteor strikes. Sneko is amazing for the fact that it allows you to do things you can never do otherwise. It leads to crazy silliness, super fun, and super powerful runs. So even if every once in a while it might screw you, you still gotta love it. Maybe don't take it with a claw deck. That's about it. 
If everything in your deck is one cost or lower, don't take it. But even if you see this at the end of Act 1, I think that's still early enough. If you don't have high cost cards, you can still afford to take it. And then Act 2 and beyond, just go for all those high cost cards and it'll balance out. So don't be afraid of the randomness much in the same way you can't be afraid of the randomness of Pandora's box. Lean into it, accept it, enjoy it, love it. It will help you out more than hurt you in the long run. Next up is Sozu, another energy relic that will have the drawback of no more potions for the entirety of the run. I'm going to put this in F tier, just above ectoplasm. It is not quite as crippling as ectoplasm. If you already have a couple really good potions in your belt stored, you can still just sit on those and bank them all the way until the heart if you want. You can use the potions, you just can't not get more potions. I think potions are a fantastic thing to have. They can act as a panic button in an emergency situation, or you can use them proactively by planning out. You say, I want to use this artifact potion to negate uh, something from the heart, like the vulnerable, or I want to use this artifact potion to negate my biased cog, or whatever it is. I want to use artifact plus a strength potion so I don't have the strength down at the end of the turn I get to keep that permanent strength there's a lot of good potions like fairy in the bottle that you're just gonna sit on and bank for the whole run and if you get sozu with fairy in the bottle you're kind of okay with it but again that really really relies on the other relics that you are offered being hot garbage you know, if you see something like Black Blood, Sozu, Ectoplasm, you're like, oh boy, I just got the worst ones. Sozu might be the most tankable, but it is not something that you're ever really super happy about. There are very few, very few situations that I would take this if I didn't have any other better options. Next up is Tiny House. This is one of those relics that instead of giving you one really good thing, it offers you a wide range of a lot of small good things. You get one potion, you get a card, you get an upgrade, you get a little bit of gold, and none of it by itself is great. Even all put together, I wouldn't say that this is a great relic. I also don't think it deserves quite amount, quite the amount of hate that it gets from a lot of people on the subreddit. I'm going to throw this very much in C tier. I think it is very situational in that, once again, the overall relic pool is quite strong. You are probably going to be offered something better. But if you are not, it is not the worst take. Like, I'm not gonna skip a tiny house. I don't think I ever skip any relic or any offer. I always take something. Skipping a boss relic, even a really, really bad boss relic, I don't know if I could do it, just on principle. But tiny house does give you a lot of little things. Also gives you some max HP. Forgot to throw that out there, but even though max HP is not the number one factor in win rate, certainly, it's still a lot of little good things. Not sexy, not fun, not super interesting, but it gives you some stuff. That's about all you can say about it. Next up is Velvet Choker. One additional energy per turn at the cost of no longer being able to play more than six cards in a single turn. I'm gonna throw this at the top of D tier. I think there are 
some decks that can relatively easily, easily get away with this. You've got some high cost cards and you're not trying to play a lot per turn, but I think there are plenty of times when you can easily play more than six cards per turn without even trying to very hard. So the limit on this is extremely limiting <laughs> if there's a less eloquent way to say that, I don't know. This is twice as bad as Time Eater. You know, Time Eater, at least you can play 12. This is only six. It doesn't have to be an infinite deck to play more than six cards. Lots of decks can easily play more than six. Some can get away with less than six. But even if you don't need to play more than six cards per turn. It's just more fun. I could kill an enemy in five turns playing six cards per turn, or maybe I could kill the enemy in the combat in two turns and just have two really big, really fun turns. Nothing feels better than getting lots of cards and playing them. So this is just very anti-fun. Next up is Violet Lotus. This gives you additional energy once you leave Calm as the Watcher. This is going to be our only exclusive relic that goes into the S tier. Just because of how completely overpowered it is, you're doing something the Watcher already loves to do that is already overpowered. If you've got like a mental fortress this is gonna make generating block even easier because you're going in and out of these stances more often getting more block it is just crazy especially if you're trying to go infinite this makes that easier because you don't need a one cost calm like the fear no evil or inner peace sometimes that's the biggest hurdle is just finding that one cost calm that will actually allow the infinite to be possible. This makes an infinite possible with vigilance. You get an upgrade on eruption, that's it. You get a tantrum, you get a rush down, that's it. That's your infinite right there. All you have to do is remove cards now. So this is your I win relic on the Watcher in my eyes. Our final relic on the boss relic tier list is the silent exclusive wrist blade. This gives all zero cost attacks in your deck plus four damage. I'm gonna throw this in C tier. I think that personally as someone who creates a lot of shiv decks i'm generally quite happy to see this but obviously that kind of relies on you having a significant amount of zero cost cards even something like backstab it benefits from wrist blade but you can't say that plus four damage to backstab is like a big deal. It's not something that you're gonna be really excited to see if you're not also running a shiv deck with backstab. Obviously if you're not doing shivs, if you don't have zero cost attacks, this is completely worthless to you. If you're doing a poison deck with no shivs, then this is this is a brick. So, for that reason, C tier. It can be great. It's essentially like almost an accuracy. Could be even better than an accuracy in some ways, depending on 
how many different zero cost attacks you can get, though I wouldn't say you want to be like taking a bunch of slices just because of wrist blade. This is mainly going to be something that you're working with with Blade Dance and Storm of Steel. But you can even get a little bit of value out of it just with your, your neutralize. Then again, obviously, if neutralize is the only zero cost card in your deck, this is not something you're going to be excited to see. You're going to take something else. So, very situational. All right, guys, that is the boss relic tier list. I feel pretty good about this one. I don't know, maybe a couple relics. I think maybe people who have more knowledge about that particular character with some of these exclusive relics, you might have a good argument. In general, though, I think this is pretty representative about what the community at large may view these as. But if you have a different opinion, feel free to let me know. I'm always ready to learn, ready to hear what you guys have to say. Up next, we're going to have events or shops. Not quite sure yet. I might even try to squeeze them into one video, depending on how much I ramble on. I've been trying to keep this a little bit shorter. As always, thanks for sticking around to the end. Drop a like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And stay tuned for our next Tuesday Tips and Tricks videos, as well as the Saturday content. Be it, be it a Ascension Climb run, Daily Climb, or some sort of challenge run. Thanks again, and see you soon.